some questions after we talked about divorce and remarriage last weekend, as I'm sure, <laughs> sure I will continue. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, let me just reemphasize the fact that Scripture gives God's original intention for marriage, that one man, one woman make a covenant before God that's witnessed by people, uh, endorsed by the state, to live together, to stay faithful to each other for a lifetime. That's the plan. Jesus said that's still God's standard, but he does allow for divorce when adultery has been committed, and later Paul adds desertion as the second valid reason. What I didn't talk about, and, and y'all are great pointing this stuff out, is abuse and, and addiction. I mean, those two things can make marriage a living hell, and they're so prevalent in our culture today. And I want to give you a principle that I think applies to those situations, because there's nothing in the Bible that says, you know, this is uh, what God thinks. But Jesus had great compassion on people. Matthew 12, 20 says, he will not crush the weakest reed or put out a, a flickering candle. So I think he makes concessions when it comes to uh, divorce because of the brokenness of our hearts. I, I think he allows us to end a marriage when it's crushing us or when it's endangering our children. Now, having said that, I don't believe that you do that in one step. I, I don't think you just pull the plug. I, I think you get a legal separation so you're safe. You get counseling so you can help, you know, get uh, clarity and figuring out, you know, what's really happening, what really is playing, the dynamics that are playing into this whole thing and maybe feeding it, get some distance time-wise so you can heal and get healthy and strengthen your relationship with God. And even then, you need to give it more time. I mean, God can do miracles if we'll apply forgiveness and prayer. And the sacred bond of marriage is not something we break willy-nilly, that to, to just, you know, go, well, you know, it's not working out. So if you're unhappy... Or if your husband or wife is woefully imperfect, join the club. You know, we're all that way. And you're trying the irreconcilable differences angle, you know, to get out. The Hollywood crowd's, you know, got a revolving door in that area, revolving door marriages right now. This is not what we're talking about here. If your spouse has been faithful and not physically abusive, you don't have a valid excuse. I mean, you can learn to forgive, and you can get counseling, take classes, work on your marriage with the rest of us, and work on your character, and most important, lean on the Holy Spirit. You've made a commitment before God that he deems sacred. That bond is sacred, and he will work with you on this big time. Here's what we forget. This life is not mostly about us being fulfilled or having fun. I mean, it's mostly about us learning to become more like Jesus because we want to be close to him. And what I taught last weekend can help people who are in a second marriage uh, to understand that God forgives adultery, just like any other sin, that you know, they can repent and come back into full status as members of his kingdom and members of the church. And if your spouse was faithful and you remarried, I mean, uh, the act of adultery is a one-time act. It's not perpetual as the, uh, some churches, I'm not going to name any churches, but a whole lot of mainline churches have, have erroneously taught over the years. And it's wounded people. It's kept them out of the church. So I would say to you, Go online. You can now, you know, on our webpage, and our webpage is getting updated this week, but on our webpage or on Facebook, our Facebook account, you can be pointed right to the YouTube uh, video of it, or uh, I think it's still on iTunes. I mean, there are multiple ways that you can watch this and encourage them to watch it or listen to it. Uh, you can listen to it now right off your phone or, or watch it. Uh, but this could be really liberating. I, I've heard from some of you who it just set you free. And, and I want people to be set free. I, I, I think, you know, it's time to get back into church. If you've let this, you know, keep you out, don't. Now, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he's showing us how to get beyond the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. He's not giving us a code of conduct for every situation in life. And that's why I'm going to continue to make mistakes, so you guys call me on it when I do, and not covering enough ground. 
But this is more an explanation of God's intent behind the law. So this is not something we apply in a mechanical, rigid sort of way. We do it with the Holy Spirit's help, asking him for illumination, for power to pull it off, because none of this is doable apart from him. Jesus said, without me, you can't pull this off. You can't do it. And then the section we're looking at today, Jesus addresses an issue that is affecting our nation as well as our personal lives. It's a crisis of trust that results from spinning the truth and failing to keep our word. And we are inundated with it. Confidence in our government right now is at an all-time low. The polls are abysmal. They say that 80% of us would like to throw out the entire Congress and start over. In fact, the word politics and lying now are synonyms. Did you know that? I mean, we, when somebody's caught in a bold-faced lie, we say, oh, they're just playing politics. Now, I know there are honest politicians, all right? I know some, but my goodness. And it's not just in politics. It's a study by the University of Massachusetts found that 60% of us in this country can't go 10 minutes without lying. 60% of us. And the problem with truth telling starts about as soon as we start talking, too. Let's watch this. John, what are you eating? You didn't eat anything. Yeah. John, look at mommy. Anything. Are you telling me the truth? That. You didn't have any snacks? Nope. Let me see. You don't have any snacks. Open wide, let me see. Really, you didn't have any snacks. John, come here. John, can you explain to me why, why the sprinkles are empty? Well, they're not empty. John, look at me. They're not empty. Did you eat those sprinkles? No. I did not. You know it's not nice to tell stories and to lie, right? Look at Mommy. You're not supposed to lie. Tell me now. Did you eat those sprinkles? No. I did not. Yeah, it sprinkles. John, mm -hmm. you have sprinkles on your face. Did, um, no, no. I did not eat sprinkles. I did not. He's backing away. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to it, right? Well, it's certainly not, you know, we're certainly not the first group to struggle with this. I mean, we can trace it all the way back to the opening scenes in the Bible where uh, Cain kills his brother Abel out of jealousy and tries to, to tell God, you know, I, you know I, it wasn't my fault, you know, tries to blame his brother for the, or, or, or something, tries to get his way out of it. Further back, his parents lied when they were caught red-handed, you know, eating the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. The devil made us do it, you know. By the time Jesus comes along, lying is so commonplace, people frequently resorted to oaths or vows to convince each other. This time, I'm really telling the truth. I'm really telling. This is the first century version of the pinky swear, you know what I'm saying? You know, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Remember saying those things? Now, for certain solemn situations. God did allow for oaths to be sworn in his name as long as the one swearing was completely honest. But he warned them back in Leviticus 19.12. He said, do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. By swearing an oath, they were actually calling down the judgment of God on their own head if they were lying. They, were, they used it in courts much like we do today when we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And to understand this better, you need to know a little bit about the background of Israel. This nation was a theocracy. They literally, in the literal sense of the word, were one nation under God. He birthed them. And as their sovereign ruler, they had this rich history of divine involvement in their affairs. I mean, God fought many of their battles for them. I don't think he's done doing that. I think that's uh, a lot of what's happening right now over there, and we're supposed to be praying for them. In fact, the Bible pronounces a blessing on those who pray for Jerusalem and 
for the peace of Jerusalem. And we're going to do some of that at the foundry tonight. We have a prayer time, an intercession time. Uh, Caleb and I will be uh, leading in that. I'd, I'd invite you to come down. That's at the end of the runway down there uh, that we have a, a beautiful place uh, for prayer. Uh, but, but here's what I want us to see in re- regard to this. On numerous occasions... God would use his power to right wrongs and deal with rebellious in- individuals. I mean, it's, it's uncanny. If you re- read through Old Testament scripture, he even gave their priest a supernatural method for detecting falsehood and releasing judgment to come on the unrepentant. So these people operated under a healthy fear of profaning the Lord's name. Lying under oath was out of the question. I mean, it's one of the major reasons their society works so well. Why ours is in decline right now. Whenever they swore an oath, they made absolutely sure that what they were saying was true and that they fulfilled their promise to the letter. But again, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, the religious leaders have twisted the laws of Moses to serve their own purposes. They said, okay, no wiggle room if we swear by God's name, but if we swear by something less than God's name, then we can be a little less truthful. And they created this whole insane system of made-up vows, you know, where some were binding and some were not. For instance, if you made a vow by something created, that wasn't binding. But if you swore by the temple, you know, that was a little bit more, uh, uh, that had a greater degree of sanctity, so you had to be at least 50% truthful. If you swore by the gold in the temple, you could be 25% truthful. And if you swore by your own head, you know, you could sell fishing poles for fishing in the Red Sea, or Dead Sea, rather. So, I mean, you, you could lie your head off, basically. Then Jesus comes on along in the Sermon on the Mount and exposes their hypocrisy. In Matthew 5, he says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, don't break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, don't swear at all either by heaven, for it's God's throne, by earth, for it is his footstool, and do not swear by your own head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. See, where are you people getting this? I mean, it's absurd to think you're free to lie for any reason. And then he sums up his whole teaching here on what it means to tell the truth and keep your commitments here in uh, verse 37, where he says, simply let your yes, let's read this together, let's start over. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. That would solve so many of our problems. He's giving us what he's really after here. It's simply say what you mean and mean what you say. If you say you'll do something, do it. Jesus said, I am the truth. So that's going to be a defining characteristic of all of my followers. I want you to stand out from the crowd. I want you to be salt and light in the, all the darkness that's going on and all, the, and all the perversion and all the decadence that's happening. I want you to be a person who always tells the truth. Lying is no small issue with God. He hates it. And we're going to see where it'll end up taking us too. But, but it's, that is not to say that God doesn't love people who tell lies. One of the clearest facts in the Bible is God loves sinners. It's the reason he sent his only son to die on a cross for us. Paul says that while we were still helpless, Christ died for us. He's interested in every aspect of our well-being, and lying definitely messes with that. That's why he cares about these things. In fact, a, a 2012 study at the University of Notre Dame found that less lying improved a person's physical and mental health significantly. They found that anxiety, depression, headaches, and sore throats all diminished. Not to mention how close personal relationships improved and how much other social interactions were enhanced. Lying causes stress. You know, I mean, we all know that. You got to hide the sprinkles on your teeth. You can't smile. They can't let anybody smell your breath. You've been eating sprinkles. And there's the stress of exaggerating our commitments and trying to cover our tracks, making excuses for being late and failing to do what we said and trying to keep our stories all straight. We stress ourselves out, do all kinds of damage to our relationships when we lie. And God's concerned about that because he cares about us. He cares about our peace of mind. He cares about our reputation and our character development and all the other positive things 
that we put in jeopardy when we compromise the truth. Let me give you a few of those. Proverbs 10, 9 says, the honest person will live in safety, but the dishonest will be caught. Psalm 25, 21 says, may integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you. Psalm 41, 12 says, you have upheld and supported me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. And Proverbs 11.3 says, honesty guides good people. Dishonesty destroys treacherous people. So God's making it clear to us. Honesty keeps us safe. It protects, supports, even guides us. But dishonesty leads to ruin. It's terribly destructive. Now, there's just no way to cover all the aspects of truth-telling in one weekend. In fact, the more I've thought about it, the more, I mean, there's so many tributaries to this. And we are in such deep weeds in this issue right now. I mean, the stuff people post on their Facebook page and the stuff we, I don't you guys that are trying to date online, good luck with that. Wow. I mean, the whoppers, people tell them. We're always trying to look better than we are and trying to, you know, go down this road. So we can't cover everything in a weekend. So let's narrow this down and look at truthfulness in our casual commitments. And we're talking about those offhand promises we make to people like our coworkers and friends and parents and spouses and children. We generally have the best of intentions. The problem is we just don't take our words very seriously anymore. You know, we just don't really think very much of, you know, that it's that important to be accurate. But every time we fail to follow through on a commitment we make, somebody gets hurt, especially in the context of a marriage. You know, I found out right away when I say, I'll be home for dinner tonight, go ahead and start the pasta, that means get up and leave the office, you know, get home. Or let's do date night every, every Friday this year. Those are the easiest commitments in the world to make and break. But the effects on the relationship are toxic. And then there are the commitments we make to our kids where we say, I'm going to be at every one of your baseball games this year, every concert, every recital. I'm going to be there, but you're not. And because kids are naive and trusting enough to think that since you're an adult, you know, and a parent, your, your, your yes ought to mean yes and your no ought to mean no, and they get wounded by it. Not only is their ability to trust us damaged, their, their, uh, tr- their confidence in us damaged, their, their understanding the importance of keeping their own word is diminished. Here's what we want to do with our kids and anybody that has been affected by a broken promise of ours. First, we want to go to the person and acknowledge what we've done. You know, it's a one-sentence statement. Hey, you know, I didn't do what I said. I was wrong. I mean, I apologize. I'm really sorry. Or you could say, you know, forgive me. More times than not, a person will, you know, shrug it off and say, it's okay. No, not a big deal. But you have to have the integrity to follow up with what you say. Lies destroy trust. Once trust is gone, the relationship is going to be difficult to restore. Here's the deal. Here's the problem. Lying is a habit that de- t- typically develops, you know, in almost an unnoticed way. I mean, we start lying about stuff that doesn't even matter, and it becomes this pattern, and it destroys our credibility. It destroys our friendships. You don't lose integrity because you've gotten overwhelmed or you ran late or you dropped the ball or simply forgot. But you do if you don't look them in the eye and make up for it. And I'm talking about the simplest statements, not just with your family. I mean, this happens in all kinds of situations these days. People are promoting themselves, trying to look better than they are. And in a false way, they kind of exaggerate their commitments. They want to join the soccer team or the leadership team at work. doesn't matter, you know, what it is, big or small, and they oversell themselves, you know, as being highly committed, you know. Yes, I'll do all of that, absolutely, I'll be there, you can count on me. A few months go by and nobody's looking and they start flaking off. They skip practices and team meetings and they skip training times, they don't follow through on their financial issues and thousand illustrations of this. I mean, you can probably think of a bunch, you know, right now. It's a big subject, encompasses every area of our lives. It's not just social situation on a job. I mean, it can be skipping an event you signed up for here at the church or uh, failing to show up when you're scheduled to volunteer. 
I mean, it's, it's uncanny how you, you know, people just make commitments without considering that, there, you know, there may be consequences for that. In every situation in life, our, our word is our bond. Jesus means this. The Sermon on the Mount is not for extra credit. It's like, you know, if you get the Big Ten right, well, you know, here's an extra credit sign. No, he's saying this is what living the Christian life looks like. Every bit of it. You got to line up your actions with where your born again spirit is wanting to take you. You can't follow the crowd and, and do Christianity on Sunday morning. I mean, that's what he's saying. But I know the logic. Yeah, but nobody saw me not do what I agreed to do, you know, when I joined the team, got the job, moved into the neighborhood. Nobody saw me violate what I said I would do. You know, I, I didn't get caught. The Holy Spirit said, I saw you. And it's messing with who you are. Your heart won't connect with me when you do this stuff. You've been praying, praying the trust prayers, and you're wondering why you're not getting any traction. Here it is, right here. Your heart won't connect when you're violating these things. You, you said you'd do it, so either do it or go acknowledge it to the person you have said it to. And we're talking all the people that are being affected by or not doing it. Now, a lot of folks say, but since I didn't get caught, technically, nobody cares. And the Lord says, I care. Because you said, I'll do that. I'll be at those meetings. I'll serve. You're bound by your word. Act like my son or daughter. There's not a single promise I make that I don't keep. That's how I want you to act. Because people think, you know, well, they didn't call me on it. The Lord says, do they really need to? Lies destroy the fabric of, that, that makes relationship work and uh, relationships work and hold together. It's trust. And once trust is gone, it's very difficult to restore. Someone call trust the most expensive thing there is. It takes years to earn and just seconds to, just, to, to lose. Scott Peck in his book, uh, The Different Drum, presents an interesting theory about relationships. This has really helped me over the years. He said, God designed us to yearn for open, honest, authentic relationships. He calls them communal relationships. As Christians, we call that community. But because we generally choose keeping the peace over telling the truth, we end up in what he calls pseudo or fake communal relationships instead. And it, these are the kind of relationships that are strictly surface level where nobody risks anything. People in these relationships never reveal their hurt feelings or discuss misunderstandings or air their frustrations or ask difficult questions. The underlying rule is don't rock the boat. Don't disturb the peace, but it's a counterfeit peace. Misunderstandings arrive, but they never re get resolved. Feelings need to be shared, but they're kept hidden. Offenses occur, but nobody talks about them. When doubts about integrity creep in, they're never dealt with. So over time, relationships like that deteriorate. All that hurt and misunderstanding lead to feelings of detachment, distrust, and bitterness. Feelings of love begin to die. Now here's the kicker. Peck says the only antidote is to steer your relationship into a period of sheer chaos. A time when you dig up the hurts, you expose the hostilities, you ask the tough questions, and unfortunately, this is the only way out. He said, if you've ever driven from Denver to go skiing in Keystone or Breckenridge, you know you have to go through the Eisenhower Tunnel. Those of us who've been out there, we know about that. Now, he says, now you may hate tunnels with a passion, but if you want to get to Keystone in winter, especially after a snowstorm, it's the only way. And some of us, he says, need to go through that tunnel of chaos to get honesty back into our relationships. It may not seem attractive, but it's the only way things are going to change. And as I said, that, that has helped me immeasurably. Because I'm one of those per people that I don't like confrontation. You know, I don't like turbulence. And, and you know what I'm talking about. I mean, if you're going to get this relationship right, you got to ask a question that you don't want the answer to, you know, that you don't really want them to tell you what they really think. And, and so, you know, I've had some of those kind of breakthroughs, and I want to tell you, it is so worth it. It is so worth it. It is horrible getting there, but it is so worth it. Because most people just, you know, want things peaceful and shallow, you know, rather than the breakthrough to authentic community. God designed us for that. 
All right, so that rabbit trail, but it was a good one. All right, let's go back to the habit of lying. Let me tell you why we're focusing on this again. Just because something has become culturally acceptable, and lying has become acceptable in this culture, does not make it right, and it does not mean that people aren't getting hurt by it. Every time we break a casual commitment, we can count on the fact that damage is being done. Our credibility is diminished, our trust is eroded, our character is undermined, our relationships are strained, and often it's the people we love most who end up feeling devalued and wounded. Our hearts get harder and more insensitive to God's Spirit, who's always there trying to help, saying, look, I'll help you. Just stop doing this, you know, tell the truth. But Jesus says, guys, this isn't hard to get right. Just let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Decide from here on out your words are going to count. That you're going to do what you say even if it hurts. I mean, wouldn't it be great to be known as a person of integrity who always tells the truth? I mean, you can trust that guy. I'm telling you, he always tells the truth. Well, we want that kind of reputation. We want to be the salt and light Jesus left us here to be. We want out of this darkness that's coming on our society. We want to have that kind of reputation with God, too, because here's why. Psalm 15, 1, David said, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? Meaning, who, who can experience your presence? And then the next verse, he answers the question. Look at it. Let's read it. It's he who speaks the truth from his heart. There it is. In other words, they do the simple things they say they'll do. That's the kind of person who gets to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Psalm 91 is one of my favorite psalms. It's about, you know, dwelling in the secret place of of the Most High God, and it talks about, you know, all the protection and the, and the pleasure and all the goodness that's there. But David's telling us how. It's speaking the truth. It's meaning, saying what you mean and meaning what you say. You can't experience his presence. I don't care how many times you pray trust prayers or whatever you pray, if you're violating your conscience, if you're violating your heart and God's word, things aren't going to work. In verse 4, David says, they swear to their own hurt, meaning they, they make a deal and it goes bad and it hurts them because it didn't work out right, but they keep their word anyway. They don't back down, even when it costs them. And again, I'm talking to simple things of life. I can tell you from experience, the pain of keeping an idle promise to your child, your spouse, your friend, a business acquaintance is a powerful way of training your lips to speak the truth. I'd, you know, make promises, or I didn't think they were promises, and the kids would say, Daddy, you promised. And I'd say, well, no, no, I technically, and Debbie's sitting in the front seat usually going, yes, you did promise. Yes, you did. I was there. I heard you promise. Well, it looks like we're going to Six Flags. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take much of that before you think, before you speak, right? I mean, man, when you have to spend a day out in the 100 degrees, and <laughs> you do I don't want a beer. Why did I say this? You know, <laughs> and you ought to take your kids to Six Flags or well, that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that you know, you know how this works, right, parents? Come on, you thinking? I didn't really say that, did I? <laughs> yes, you did. So if you do a few of those things, if you force yourself to follow through with those things, you'll learn to think before you speak. Jesus is teaching us what it means to be salt and light in a dark, deteriorating world. It's keeping our commitments. It's staying loyal to what we said we were going to do long after the mood we set it in has left us. <laughs> I, lo I love something Lewis Smead said about this. Listen to this. Yes, somewhere people can still make and keep promises. They choose not to quit when the going gets rough because they promise once to see it through. They stick to lost causes. They hold on to a love grown cold. They stay with people who have become pains in the neck. They still dare to make promises and care enough to keep the promises they make. I want to say to you that if you have a ship you will not desert, if you have people you will not forsake, if you have causes you will not abandon, then you are like God. 
What a marvelous thing a promise is. When a person makes a promise, she reaches out into an unpredictable future and makes one thing predictable. She will be there even when being there costs her more than she wants to pay. When a person makes a promise, he stretches himself out into circumstances that no one can control and controls at least one thing. He will be there no matter what the circumstances turn out to be. With one simple word of promise, a person creates an island of certainty in a sea of uncertainty. When a person makes a promise, she stakes a claim on her own personal freedom and power. When you make a promise, you take a hand in creating your own future. Is that not good? (laughs) The Apostle Paul goes so far as to say truth-telling is the primary way we become spiritually mature. Listen to what he says here in Ephesians 4.15. He said, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He said, it's speaking the truth in love that we grow up in it. That's how how we become spiritually mature, doing that tunnel of chaos thing with each other, speaking the truth to each other in love. There's no way we're going to have a healthy relationship with God or people if integrity doesn't become a major issue in our lives, if we're not willing to call each other and call ourselves on this stuff and just say, you know, let's stop it. Let's stop the man. Let's let's stop the pretense and overselling ourselves and all of this stuff. You know, let's Let's stop making casual commitments that we are not even thinking about following through on. You know, think about it. The single reason we can place our trust in God is because he always keeps his word. I mean, that's the one characteristic about him that enables us to relate to him with confidence. There's no bait and switch with God. We know he's not going to change on us. When he, we trust his promises, promises, they're as certain as the sun is to rise. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, even when we are too weak to have any faith left, he remains faithful to us and will help us, for he cannot disown us who are part of himself. And he will always, always, always carry out his promises to us. We can always count on God to mean what he says. Hebrews 6.18, it is impossible for God to lie. So if we want to be close to a God like that, if we want to be close to Jesus, we need to start acting like him. We need to become a people of integrity who say what they mean and mean what they say. People who live by the imperative, my word is my bond. You in agreement? (laughs) All right. Now, I'm thinking about this all week, and for some reason this verse eluded me until I was on the way here last night, and This is not a pleasant verse, but when God describes where this is all going, in Revelation 21, and and the time has come for him to come, he said he's going to come and live with us forever. We're going to be with not just Jesus, but Father God. I mean, with him, with us. In verse 8, he tells us about a group of people who won't be there. And it's, it's a rather alarming verse because there's a list of people and uh, the sexually immoral are there. The ones who just, you know, flaunted the idea of God putting any control on their lives. And we went over that, how there's this, you know, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. There are degrees where God gives us up to perversion. And, and, uh, and there comes a point where the perversion identifies who we are. We are the sexually immoral. We are the murderer. We are the abominable. Because all of those are included in the sorcerers, idolaters. But the one I wanted you to see, and all translations put the same thing, and all liars, all liars shall have their part. Now, I'm reading this in the New International. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. That's a lot of translations put the burning sulfur. That's a sobering thing. Because what that says is, if you go down this road long enough, lying becomes your identity. I mean, you're bonded to the darkness, and it will determine 
where you spend eternity. I don't want that for any of us. So this is, you know, a lifetime of practicing these things will take you down. It'll destroy your soul. So that's, that's, that's just a sobering reality. Now here's the, here's the thing we're going to come back to. None of this is doable in our own strength. So we're, we're, we're helpless to do this without power, but we're hooked to power. Paul says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is where this new life inside us wants to take us. So it's not like we're underpowered. It's not like we don't have energy for this. This is why your heart right now is saying, you need to do this. Let's get going. Come on. This is who we are. There's, there's something inside all of us who have been born again that is saying this. Now, if you're not experiencing that, here's God's promise to you. To anyone who will trust him, it's found in Ezekiel 36, 26. God says, I will give you. Let's read this out loud together. Oh, we, got, we got a moment here. I will give you a new heart. I will give you new and right desires and put a new spirit within you. I will take out your stony hearts of sin and give you new hearts of love. If you've never asked God to do that, this is where integrity starts. I mean, you need him to remove that insensitivity you've developed toward dishonesty and give you the right kind of desire to be a truthful person in everything you do. And that can happen right now. I mean, it just simply means admitting to yourself, I am helpless to change here. I need your help, God. There's one thing that God demands before we can receive his forgiveness, and that is to simply recognize our sinfulness and admit our failure to be able to do anything about it on our own. That's what positions us to receive grace, the grace that God wants to pour into our lives through Jesus. That's the first and second beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn their condition, who go, God, I cannot pull this off. I cannot do this in myself. So why don't you stand with me and let's just pray. Let's ask God to do that right now. You just, in your heart, you just acknowledge to God your own weakness. Lord, here we are. All, are, all of us are in this together. We're all caught in this vortex of darkness that's descending on us. And, and the darkness in us wants to go this way. We want to give in to this false way of communicating and relating and exaggerating and promoting ourselves and not keeping our commitments and saying words that are idle. Lord, all of that's in every one of us. It's in me. Would you help us? Would you help us right now we're reaching out to you in our weakness. We're acknowledging, God, that we have sinned, that we've, that we've all made idle commitments, and we're going to change. Help us today to, to make decisions that we're going to say what we mean and mean what we say, that we're going to be truth tellers, that we're going to be known for people who always tell the truth, even if it's to our own hurt. Lord, we just ask you for your grace. We're asking you to change us at the heart level. Renew our minds. Holy Spirit, would you rise up in us and strengthen us? Would you forgive us for the damage we've done and help us to make things right? Help us to go back to people we've wounded and hurt by our idle words. Lord, we want to be like you. We want to be close to you. We love you. We're your people. We want to live this out. In Jesus' name.